for your opening statements. So, um, the Federation of Cambridge Residents Association and the Friends of the CAM have uh, provided the first two questions, which I will read out. Um, so, we'll start with our first question. Given that growth is constantly being promoted as a panacea for many of the issues facing both Cambridge and the wider economy, and is universally considered a good thing by the main political parties, for how long do candidates believe the problem of growth can be solved with further growth? And can they produce any examples where growth in Cambridge has benefited local residents? either in terms of affordability, of everyday living, or improvements to the natural and built environment. Um, so, Daniel, can I have you start us off? Yes, certainly, because I suppose I, I'd say, what is the opposite? Um, we've seen over the last few years uh, the, the, the economic problems that have stemmed from a stagnant economy in this country. We've seen inequality rising, We've seen exactly the problems I've already mentioned about the uh, difficulty that young people find finding affordable housing, not just to buy, but to rent in this city. So the choice is, and I absolutely accept it, and there is a, an academic argument to be had about growth versus not growing, but certainly it's the Labour Party's view, it's my view too, that sustainable growth, and perhaps that's the bit that we've um, not been talking about enough, sustainable growth is the way in which we can tackle some of these issues. And in terms of improvements in Cambridge, I think I'm going to make myself a bit unpopular here, but I think there are plenty of things in Cambridge that actually have improved over the last 20, 30 years. I remember when I first came here um, as a student in 1976, I think back to, I mean, I, I do not think that the station development has been an inspiring example of, uh, of, of architecture, but I do remember the heaps of bicycles that used to be uh, strewn around that area. And I actually think it's better having a secure, even though it's not quite sometimes secure enough, bike park there for 3,000 bicycles. And although, as I say, I'm not sure it'd be quite my style of architecture, I think Station Square is better than what we had before. So I'm afraid I don't take this pessimistic view that we can't do things better in the future, we can't grow the economy in a sustainable way. And I think if we're going to tackle the inequality that I've already mentioned, that is the way to do it. Okay, so sustainable growth, I would argue that that's an oxymoron at this point. Um, any, any, word that is, any positive word that is matched with growth, uh, good growth, even green growth, we have to let that go now because that's the, the wrong story to be following. As Greens, we feel it's our responsibility to argue to become agnostic about growth and leave it Leave it, leave it in the past where it belongs. It's not taking, it's taking us down the proverbial without a paddle, quite literally. <laughs> um, so it's, we believe, uh, also in terms of the second part of the question, um, has it benefited local residents? I don't see how growth has benefited local residents. If you think about the average house price, um, it's astronomical at the moment, just even to <coughs> in Cambridge, it's £600 a, a month, and we can't, I mean, I came here in 2002, I didn't come as a Cambridge student, I came here to, to train as a teacher, and I found it immediately difficult in Cambridge. But, um, and I love the fact, the second day I was here, I got a bicycle, but I couldn't afford to be here. And it was, you know, I mean, so many times I've thought about moving back up north, because, you know, to get onto the housing ladder, and to even just just get into the city centre, I don't know, by a with a taxi, it's, it's absolutely, you know, it's very, very expensive. Also, in terms of, um, um, yeah, so trans uh, transport, housing, it's, it's not easy to live here. It's, it's, just, it's just not easy to live here. And I know lots of other people who have left Cambridge because they can't afford to be here. Thank you. Now, there is, uh, I, I love to mix between medicine and politics because uh, medicine is my uh, 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 speciality and politics is my hobbies and I'm an uh, uh, advisor in politics. Now, there is a benign uh, growth and there is a malignant growth. What we are facing here, to be honest, is a malignant growth. When you have overgrowth the city and, and the people suffering, there is not enough transport, the roads down, 
uh, the a and &E is very small, it's for a small city. How come you are over expanding the city? Number two, can our council, can our city look after the new area? No. So, who is, sometimes I'm questioning, to be honest, I'm asking myself, who is running the city? Because if you go down to new areas, it's run by big companies. What I need here, I need the people, our workers and councillors to control these areas, not companies. We are not work, you know, we are workers, we are the citizen here. But who's controlling the new areas is companies. So we have to obey their own laws. I don't know if in five years, ten years, they will, uh, you know, charge us extra fees and the council and the city can't see anything. In my area, for example, Darwin Green, uh, if there's any problem, <coughs> if I call the council, no, sorry, nothing to do with us, call XYZ Company, who's running the place. Uh, any glass problem, any issues, no, nothing to do with us. What about if we had a problem with them, which happened when the, the biggest foundation scandal in the history of UK happened in Darwin Green, next to my window, 84 houses being demolished. <coughs> Look to the pollution. What investigation done? What fines done? Zero. Because what? The council, nothing. We don't have enough people to investigate. We don't have people to, to, to look to see what's going on. So we have to give more power to our citizens, to our councillors, to control. Edmonton, there is lots of, it's, it's now dirty some areas, it's not safe. And my apologies, I'm cutting the line. So here we are. So we need more control for our citizens over these companies. Thank you. Thank you. I can't believe I'm going to start this by agreeing with Daniel Jaishner that um, <laughs> growth is important and there's a reason why people think that. There's only three ways that we can actually pay for the public services that we all rely on. That's to raise taxes, which I think most parties agree are, are too high at the minute. It's to cut things, which nobody wants to do. And it's to grow the economy. So we've got three choices and then growth is the least bad option. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's easy to say growth isn't benefiting me if you're doing well from life already. But there's millions of people who rely on growth to, to buy their first homes, to improve their quality of life. Um, and ultimately, the only way that we're going to improve people's quality of life is by growing the economy. You, you talk about what things have people benefited from in Cambridge. Well, just look at the, at the nearby Addenbrooke's biomedical campus. That's a world-leading facility that's only been possible from the growth. And they're actually, and under this Conservative government, we've built two brand new train stations, we're building two brand new hospitals, which I'm sure everyone living in the city will benefit from. Uh, and I would say, Sarah's absolutely lovely candidate as we've got to know each other recently, but I'm absolutely depressed by her idea that growth is a bad thing and we need to strive to somehow degrow. Like I said, I think that's something easy to say when you've got everything already. It's much harder when you're a low-income family struggling to make ends meet and you're relying on that growth to have to be aspirational to have more from your lot. So I'm, I'm going to leave it there because I don't want to add to the depression, but I think growth is key. It's a no-brainer. And as I said, if you want to pay for all the services that I'm sure every single one of us relies on here, you either raise taxes, you make cuts, or you grow the economy. And I know which one I prefer. Okay. Thank you. I find this word growth quite a tricky one because I think the word growth actually using that masks a whole number of issues underneath it. And I think for me it's more um, it's more helpful to actually talk about the issues rather than labels one and growth when none of us quite know what that means. When I think about growth, what I think about is people. When I think about the issues in Cambridge, I think about the challenges that people face. One of those is inequality. Cambridge is often said to be one of the most unequal cities in the UK, which is absolutely terrifying. And we have to do something about that. And a big part of that is making sure that people have availability of jobs in their local area. And actually, I think it's quite right that our children should be able to work and continue to live in the city that they're born in. If we stop creating those jobs, where do those people go? We also need to ensure we have affordable housing. And ensuring supply meets demand isn't the only part of that, but it's a huge part of the picture. We talk about our city being riddled with congestion and the pollution it causes, which is probably one of the biggest issues that residents talk to me on the doorstep every day. But one of the reasons for that congestion is because people have to travel in and out of the city to get to their place of work. If we address public transports, if we make sure that people actually live within the communities that they serve, so they can walk or cycle to work, we would be able to solve that problem. 
We talk about sustainability and the challenge of the environment, and quite rightly so. But I'd argue, let's not just blame it on growth, let's think about what we can also do. What's our responsibility towards that? Something I'm very proud the Liberal Democrats have done with the City Council is brought forward grey water recycling within all new council homes, which vastly reduces the water bills, but also the drain on the aquifer. So we can take forward those ambitious measures to make sure that we're doing right here. In terms of examples where growth has worked, I point you towards Eddington, which is in Castle Wards, where the City Council worked really hard with the university to make sure it was green, that there was affordable housing. And a fascinating statistic there is that if that huge development, only one in five residents have a car, because they've been positioned really carefully in the way that they work. So I'd argue it's hard, but it is doable, and we need to be bold to address that, rather than put our head in the sands and expect it not to happen to us. Because if we don't manage it well, it will. The three biggest parties here are all recommending growth. Uh, and this is the problem at the moment. It's, the problem in Cambridge is that Cambridge is um, like a goose that lays golden eggs. It produces a lot of value added through the businesses that come here, the science, etc. And this is useful for the government for tax income. I understand that it's good to redistribute tax income around the country, but to some extent you have to think about the people here. And when you look at a city that's growing in a, in a breakneck way in order to basically generate wealth for the rest of the country, there should be something in it for the people who live here as well. In fact, the people who live here, I would say the local people in any place should be the people who are considered first, before thinking about all the people who might want to come to Cambridge to buy a new house. Uh, and most of the properties that are being built, there is council flats, there is affordable um, properties, but most of what's being built is being built to attract people, high, relatively high income people, people who work in high income uh, businesses. It's not being built for the citizens who live here. And the fact that you build more and more homes doesn't mean that the prices go down. Yeah? And the fact that you bring more and more wealth in a city doesn't mean that the city gets wealthier. We can see what the result is. I, when I go around, I meet a lot of people who are not very wealthy. I meet a lot of homeless people. And I see a lot of wrecked infrastructure. I'm not saying our city is bad, but you know, by third world standards, we're great. Yeah? But, you know, let's think a bit more about the people who live here, and then we can grow. The other thing that I think about is, if we want to have science in the UK and growth, why don't we distribute it to other locations in the UK? Why does Cambridge have to be the only one at the expense of the people who live here? That's it. Lots of uh, issues have come up there. Um, gener ge generational unfairness, sustainability, corporate power, who benefits, inequality, water issues, public sector issues, lo lots of different things. Some of this we'll, we'll get to with our second question here and then we're gonna open it up to the audience. Um, the second question is also about growth but it brings in uh, Cambridge's water supply. It says, um, the greatest growth is being proposed in one of the driest places in the UK. Currently, 99% of Cambridge's water supply comes from chalk aquifers and other groundwater sources, which are already over-abstracted and drying up. The Environment Agency says it's not possible to have major growth in this region without harm to the environment, and is now objecting to developments such as Bourne and Darwin Green on the grounds that there's not enough water. Do you think that these and other major developments should go ahead regardless, and that economic growth should take priority over the environment? Um, so, Sarah, would you please start us off? Okay, so this is going back to the growth questions. It's going back to um, economics. And, um, and how we frame ourselves in the world. So um, the Greens believe that we should be becoming more eco-centric. Um, so putting, um, I believe there's also, amongst all these crises, of cl the climate crisis, housing crisis, the crisis in our NHS, there's this behavioural crisis that's going on as well. And we believe that we're somehow above it, it, 
ecology, we, we believe that we've, we've become disconnected from nature, and this is the problem um, with where we're going and that we're still banging on, there's still people at this table talking about growth now. We need economies that make us thrive whether or not they grow. There is proof in, in, in the world of countries that are already doing this. How do you explain uh, a country like Iceland, which is, it's 106 in terms of GDP, so you've got U the USA and China, number one and number two. Iceland, in terms of HDI, so this is the UN measurement, called the Human Development Index, you probably know about this. <laughs> um, it's not as sexy as GDP, I, I guess, but it's uh, a measurement that's based on how much education a, a person's um, expected to get, how long the life expectancy at birth, and also the gross national income per capita, or so per person. So it's about standard of living, okay? So up there you've got, I mean, the usual Switzerland, Norway, and Iceland is number three. Um, so this is proof that, I mean, okay, so this is high HDI, good standard of living, and low growth. We've got countries like America, which is number one there, but the life expectancy in America is 10 years lower than, than many other countries on that list. And the UK, you won't be surprised to, to, um, to know this, but as we've been talking about inequality a lot, at this end of the table we're talking about inequality a lot already. The gross national income in the, in the UK is much lower than other countries as well. So, um, yeah, so we need to really examine how we're measuring how well we do in a country, and that is key to our, our, our survival in the future as well. Thank you. We're talking about the water supply and the growth. Uh, there's two points here. Uh, one, we need really to uh, look for sustainable water supply. And uh, I can say the previous, uh, or the Labour Party for now, nine years, there is no solution. Now, the future war, if we talk about politics, or if you read for politicians, you know, and writers, they will talk about the future war is all about the uh, war for drinking water. So what we need to do, we need really to find a, a real solution. This is the reason why over expanding the city, over building, and, and without any water supply, without any, uh, resources for water is really dangerous for for the city. When we're talking about uh, 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 homeless, I think there's a point. Uh, when you have extra 15,000 new built house, take in mind from these 15,000 new built house, there's at least thousand uh, a person will not be able to pay his bills, so he will be homeless because of the cost of living. So the number of homeless people as well will go up. The number of uh, 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 patients, uh, cancer patients, that, you know, uh, 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 who need medical attention will grow up. So basically, the city is very poor to face all this disaster: the water supply, the medical needs, the the the, the homeless uh, uh, num number of homeless people. Already, there is a queue of uh, all over the country, hundreds of thousands of people waiting for for a, a, a house, and and really, this is the reason why. Over expanding Cambridge is really dangerous. We already facing pollution to our water. We are already facing uh, problems here and there. So we have to review each plan before we decide yes, go ahead or not. Each plan, even what we sign contracts with, and we need to know what contracts we have signed already with the previous companies. For how long this uh, contract? What this contract means for the citizens? So this is all about. Thank you. Thank you. Question. I think for me I'd argue that I'm not sure it has to be one or the other. Um, so Cambridge already has a very ambitious local plan in terms of housing and that's drawn up between Cambridge and South Cambridge District Councils and the council is set housing targets by the government who say given the projected growth in this area, the projected number of jobs, this is how many houses that you will need to build. Now we've drawn a red line in the sand for the first time ever in our local plan and we've said that unless the government ensures the water supply by providing a new reservoir, reservoir even, and a new pipeline, we just can't do that. So that red line there is drawn, that gauntlet has been thrown down. And what I think we're seeing here, the fact we even have to have these terrible conversations about can people come to live here because of the water, is a result of successive government failure to ensure that infrastructure is there. The projected number of jobs in Cambridge and the development is not suddenly a surprise that's crept around the corner. We've known about this for a long time. So what I really hope Daniel will be able to talk to us about tonight 
is what he's been doing over the last eight, nine years to make sure one of the first things the new government does is build that reservoir for us very, very quickly. The other thing that I would say amongst there is that I think we do need to look to ourselves to some extent as well. So we also have to take the responsibility. I mentioned grey water recycling, which is something that I think the council, and there is a role here for the Member of Parliament for Cambridge, to really champion measures of retrofitting and installing that grey water recycling at scale and making that more affordable and more possible. But I'd also ask a simple question. Can you remember the last time we had a hose pipe ban? Mm. Mm. Yeah. I do not. When, Philippa? No, I'm just saying, oh, yes, I'm, old, I'm old enough, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because we should have had one last year as well. Yeah, yes. it's exactly. When it's hitting 38, 40 degrees, it's not okay that angling water aren't putting that there as well. Yes. So I think this isn't just due to the new growth. There's an element of local responsibility that needs to be taken in this area as well. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a really important question. I'll address it absolutely directly. If we can't sort out the water issues, then of course we shouldn't be building more houses. The question is, can we sort out the water issues? And I believe we can. Sadly, um, we haven't done very well on building houses to higher standards. And I think it was a great pity that the building standards were lower at the start of the 2010 coalition government. And if you look at a lot of the housing that's been built around Cambridge, it could have been built to much higher standards. I think I can't remember the exact figures, but other countries manage to achieve I think 80 litres per, per person per day, um, and we're about 105, 110 in this country. So there's lots more we could do. Retrofitting absolutely could be part of it, although it's actually much uh, more efficient to do it when you're building the houses initially. So we could use water more efficiently, absolutely for sure. But also, there are the, there are the much bigger issues around, such as we're very close to the fens. Now, when you look at it, we are pumping huge amounts of water out into the sea at the moment. Uh, it strikes me as slightly curious that that's immediately adjacent to a city which is struggling to build houses because it doesn't have enough water. So actually, um, some of our predecessors didn't take the pessimistic view that we can't do anything. They actually did stuff, they actually built stuff, and actually transformed the landscape in this part of the world. So um, I don't think it's impossible to do. There are engineering solutions to some of this. Um, there's water being moved from one part of the country to another. But actually, the better way of doing it is not wasting water in the first place. But if you are wondering whether the, this, is, this is what would actually happen, that, that we would say no to housing if you don't get it right, it's already been put to the test. A few months ago, rather bizarrely, the government tried to overturn its own legislation on nutrient neutrality. It took a big fight in the House of Commons and then in the House of Lords to actually get the government to stick to its own previous proposals on that. And it's roughly equivalent, basically it's saying that unless you do these things, you can't build. And that's the way it should be. Thank you. Um, I think it's all a little bit contrived talking about what solutions we can bring in to allow us to grow more, you know, like pipe water from here, put it there, put the reservoir down here. It's basically like finding, finding ways to cope with a problem, and the problem is we need to grow Cambridge beyond what, Cape, what the citizens of Cambridge would like. Yeah, we just need to squeeze everything out of Cambridge, and if we're squeezing now, I mean, I think Cambridge, I'm told, generates something like 34 billion pounds of value added per year. So if we multiply that by four, we'll get 130 something billion. So let's try to see where we can pipe the water over for these pesky people to drink and wash themselves. Uh, and in the end, you're just you're contriving to produce a, a result which isn't perhaps meant to be. You're forcing things in, in a way which is almost blind. You could be developing other centers of science and research and developments throughout the country and benefiting the country, rather than focus on just one winning horse, which isn't going to be a winning horse forever, because we're running out of resources and our infrastructure is crumbling, our crime is rising, people are coming here looking for wealth, you know, because Cambridge is famous for being a rich city, and they're falling into the streets because there is no wealth available, all the doors are closed. We need to think about these things first. We also need to think about us how we strengthen our society, our communities, rather than constantly having imposed upon us the insecurity of growth, you know, mandated from above. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. So, I think one of the questions at the start, there was quite a lot in there, was um, should developments go ahead regardless of whether we have enough water? I think the short answer is obviously no, and anybody who's just suggest otherwise, 
shouldn't be taken seriously, frankly, but that, that doesn't mean that we don't ever go for growth or ever try to build houses in this area. As, as has been mentioned, we, we need to think long term and build the necessary infrastructure, such as um, the, the water supply from the fence, to make sure that it is possible in the future. We don't have to just think, well, if it's not possible now, it's never possible. We need to think more long term and build the infrastructure that we need for the future. And similarly, I think it was already said earlier, it's not a case of economic growth or the environment. Again, that would be an irresponsible position to take. We can achieve both, but obviously it's sensibly and sustainably. And that's why I'm proud that, as part of the Conservative Manifesto, we've said with regards to development, we're obviously pro-development for the reasons we mentioned. We want to build more houses to help hard-working families get on the housing ladder. But we have the important caveat that we won't do that without local support and making sure that those houses are built in the right areas. So unlike, I think, the Labour Party position, which is we're going to build, build, build regardless, we want to build, but we are very cognizant of the environment, particularly in Cambridge, that we're operating in. So we need to tread carefully, do it slowly, do it at the right pace, build the infrastructure. It's not a yes or no, it's a in time, at the right time, in the right place, which is for the last 30 seconds I have as well. Despite the, the genuine concerns, we can't forego growth because it effectively leaves people behind. As I said earlier, the three ways to raise income, uh, sorry, uh, taxes, cuts or, or growth, we need growth in order to support those at the bottom of the income scale. Those who need a house, they rely on that growth. And it's easy to say, oh, we've got loads of inequality, but we don't have people here. It's an arrogant position to say build them elsewhere. Mm -hmm. If we are welcoming and we, we do want everybody to benefit, we need to match that with action by allowing people to live here and build the houses they need. Alright, um, we'd like to um, open up the... Yeah, can I just ask this a, a postscript to that question, which was... Um, Friends that come and the question. Which is, given the comments made by the panel, do they support the Environment Agency objections uh, that you continue to protect the environment by opposing major developments in this region until there's clear evidence there is enough water to support them? Do each member of the panel... Do any of the candidates... Have any of the candidates not prepared to sign... Petition. Well, can you say that again? What do we support and what do we not support? Uh, the Environment Agency has objected to developments such as Vaughan and Darwin Green on the grounds that they're not sustainable because there's not enough water. We support these objections and ask that you continue to protect the environment by opposing major developments in this region until there is clear evidence that there is enough water to support them. I think um, having enough water is a human right issue and um, I the Environment Agency is, are, they are the experts. We've all talked about the fact there's uh, no new reservoir till 2035, no water pipe transfers until 2032. There's lots of things we can do, but we all know there's not enough water. So I want to know, are there any members of the, of the candidates who are not prepared to sign this petition? Yeah. With everyone being happy to sign it. Yeah, we all. I mean, I, I, anybody I not myself, so already prepared to sign it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Support the Environment Agency. Anybody not prepared? This is the Environment Agency. It sounds like you. Can have. I just make an observation? Yes. Sorry. Yes. <clears throat> They're all going to say something like yes, you know. Well, the easy thing to do is say yes, but uh, um, I'm, I'm a shadow minister at the moment, who's yep. probably um, to some extent in charge of the Environment Agency. And what we've got to do is res respect the way our institutions work. Mm -hmm. And politicians intervening in inter and, and pressing agencies to do particular things um, is not always the best way of doing yeah. things. No, so I, I'd absolutely say supporting that supporting I agree with the principle, but if the Environment Agency is making its objections, they should, those should stand for the Environment Agency, so why don't you not for... Well, it's not about them? whether I support it. Because what I'm trying to explain to you is we have a very complicated and, and actually, I'd say rather good set of environmental laws in this country. Mm. And as a as a potential a minister, I'm very mindful of the fact that many uh, that there will be many legal challenges. I can see Anthony nodding. <laughs> what I'm trying to explain is that there, is a, there are different roles here, and the politician's role is slightly different. So, although obviously for the purposes tonight, I will say I will sign it, 
actually, if we go down that route, we actually begin to undermine, potentially, the very protections we're trying to put in place. That is just my observation. Does democracy count? This is the question. I've spoken to, to councillors here yeah, from the centre of town. Uh, you know the Grafton Centre is being redeveloped as a, some sort of lab or, or something like that. For the third, it's the second time that that area is being crushed and then rebuilt. And most of the residents are opposed to it, but the councillors are very much in favour of it. And these are the people who represent the residents. So to what extent do we represent the residents? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think this is about what type of democracy we're in.